spend some time with me in my first few weeks after I had this last baby. We're going to talk about homemaking with a newborn and just kind of navigating the postpartum period. This is my fifth time doing this, so, you know, there are definitely moms who have done it more than I have, but, you know, I've kind of figured figured some things out. I'm learning more every time. So don't think while you're watching this video that I was just up doing all the things right after I had the baby because that is not the case. I just happened to pull my camera out every time I did get up, which was actually very little. I did get to rest quite a bit in this postpartum period, which was really, really nice. So this time of year is a very busy time of year for us to welcome a new baby, but you know, we're not going to plan like having a baby around other things. It's just going to happen when it happens and life goes on. That's just the way it is. So having a new baby in the, the springtime, basically right when spring is getting started means we have a lot of projects going on on the farm. And thankfully, my husband was able to take a week off of work at his, you know, full-time job and be home. And he wasn't, you know, they're just like waiting on me or anything. He was taking care of the kids, keeping them busy, doing projects that could, could, you know, keep them busy outside, which was the biggest way to help me. That way I could just rest inside with the baby. And that is what I did most of the time. Um, I don't, I have the baby on me in this video and I don't remember, maybe he was like a week or two old when I filmed this, but we put in raised beds and this is something I've been wanting to go back to for a long time. I just, I don't know. It, it It's an investment and a commitment to put them in, especially the way that we did it. And I, I just wanted to make sure that I definitely wanted these raised beds. So I've tried lots of gardening methods. I've tried the, you know, no-till lasagna gardening. I've done the living walkways and I like them all, but my very first year of gardening, I had a couple little raised beds and that was my favorite. I love the raised beds, so we committed this year. I got these um, Vigo garden beds. I will link them in the description for you guys. I did my research and my husband really liked the idea of going with these um, beds because they will last a lot longer than just making them out of wood. We That's what we did before. Um, and they were very weathered after like a year or two, unless you use treated lumber. But when you use treated lumber, then you've got all the chemicals like leaching into your soil. I don't know. So we went with these um, metal garden beds and I'm very, very happy with them. This was a project that my husband and kids worked on, like I said, in the, in the week after I had the baby when I was resting and um, he put all the garden beds together. He said that they were very easy to assemble as you saw him doing earlier in the video. He said definitely put them on a sawhorse because if you're going to be putting a lot of them together, um, you want to save your back. That's like always what he's thinking about because he's super tall and having to get down low to do projects is just kind of tough for him. So. As I'm doing this voiceover, you can actually hear the new little guy because I'm nursing him. He's sitting here with me um, like he always is. That's just how it is for me and for us when we have a new baby. The new baby is always with me. And you just heard a burp there. Um, you know, it's always amusing to me when I see these like Twitter, Instagram, whatever social media arguments about division of labor between husband and wife, especially when it comes to a new baby. You know, you have really strong opinions on all sides. A lot of people think that it should be 50-50. Whether the baby is breastfed or not, that the, the husband or the dad should be doing 50% of the work, waking up at night 50% of the time, like everything is split 50-50 with the new baby. And that's not really a new idea. I mean, it's somewhat new. We'll talk about that, but... <laughs> That idea of splitting things 50-50 with baby care has been around for a long time. Like, I've been a mom for a long time, longer than social media has been popular. So back when I had my first baby, you didn't get on social media to talk to other moms. You got on birth boards. If you don't know what those are, consider yourself blessed. They were a hot mess. I don't know if they're still around, but you could get on different forums and join groups, you know, with moms who had a baby in the same month as you. And basically everyone just kind of talks about 
you ask questions, share your experiences, get advice. In this concept of, you know, exactly 50-50 parenting where you basically score keep with all the kids was alive and well then. And, you know, I, I don't know when this became popular, but in the grand scheme of history, I can tell you that this is not the historical norm. I would venture to say that it was popularized sometime after formula feeding, bottle feeding, and mothers leaving the home to go into the workplace became the norm. Because before that, I mean, you don't even have to think about it. Babies were breastfed. Whether they were breastfed by their mother or by a wet nurse, they were breastfed. And that was the primary caregiver, the mother, the, the person nursing the baby. Like I said, whether it was, you know, you it was usually the mother. But in scenarios where there was a wet nurse, that was the primary caregiver. It just makes sense. That's the biological norm. That is the person, um, you know, let's just go with the mother. If the mother is breastfeeding the baby, that's the person that the baby knows the best and is the most comfortable with. Breast milk actually smells like the mother's amniotic fluid. Um, so I, you know, in my former life as a lactation consultant, I would always tell moms that when you cut that cord at birth, the breast replaces the umbilical cord. So that is the baby's lifeline. You are the baby's lifeline. They can smell you. They, you know, when they're close to you, skin to skin, their vital signs are actually more stable. So it's the healthiest thing for them to be nearest to the mother at all times. The mother is the most suitable caregiver for biological reasons. You know, you don't have to think too hard about this. It's called natural law. God created the world and created us to be able to look around and really just kind of see how things work. It's like I said, it's it's not that difficult. So... I don't know. This is something I could talk a lot about because I really think that we make things a lot, we as a society, as a culture, like Western culture, modern Western culture, we just make things so hard on ourselves by trying to score, like I said, score keep. Everything's got to be 50-50 and making things so unnatural when we would just look at how God created us and created the world and follow that. Things are a lot easier. So anyway, there's my little tangent on... 50-50 baby care. If you can't tell, I'm not a fan. I really, you know, I take care of the babies. That's just how it is. That's what works best. I wouldn't want my husband to help me take care of the babies. I'm better at it. I can change diapers better. I can change diapers faster. I know when the last time the baby pooped is. I know all the things. And it makes sense for one primary caregiver to know all those things. Okay, so back to what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm doing some food prep, just making some soup. And hard boiling some eggs, just trying to prep a bunch of stuff to keep on hand. So once again, I was not up working and cooking from scratch like all day every day. Um, these were just a few moments that I did get up and do some stuff because I, I do still have children to feed and I've got to eat. And I did prepare as much as possible, but I mean, I've got five kids. I've got big kids that eat a lot, so... Things just need to be done. By the way, my mom showed me this trick um, for making peeling hard-boiled eggs. A way to make it really easy, you just um, shake the egg in a mason jar a couple times, and then the shell comes right off. It works like a charm. I still do the ice bath. So when I boil my my eggs, I boil them in water with baking soda for five or six minutes and then turn the heat off, let them sit in the hot water for another five to six minutes or so, and then put them in an ice bath for about five minutes. Then do the mason jar trick, and they really do peel so easily. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that their baby does not like being in a wrap or a carrier, and that just makes it impossible to get anything done because their baby fusses when they put them in, in the wrap in the carrier. And, you know, I'm not trying to claim that I know everyone's baby or I know everyone's situation, but, you know, for all of history, babies have been worn and have been carried and the, it, it was just a necessity that had to be done because, you know, strollers, car seats, 
swings, all, all that didn't exist. So what I have found is it's really a lot about timing um, and, and just making sure that baby is comfortable before you put them in the wrap or in the carrier. And sometimes it takes patience too. So, you know, you can't just put baby in a wrap when you need to get stuff done if the baby's needs are not met first. And, you know, when I think of baby's needs being met, are they hungry? Ha has their milk digested? So, you know, I would not advise nursing them and then immediately putting them in the wrap because usually they need 10, 15 minutes to kind of let everything settle to maybe get a good burp out and they might have to go potty, have to go poop, and they need to do all these things before they can really settle in and fall asleep in the wrap. And getting to know your baby's patterns and needs and cues for when they're hungry or they need to burp or they're gassy or they need to go potty or poop, like getting to know all that can take some time. That's why it really is important to honor the postpartum rest period as much as possible. Um, like I said, it's not always possible. I know that very well, but any time that you can just sit down with your baby and just hold them and pay attention to their patterns, do that. And you'll get to know that they do have a pattern. Um, maybe it's, you know, that they like to nurse and then burp and then be awake for a while and then potty and poop and nurse again and do this that cycle again and then they're ready to settle in. And that's when you would want to put them in the wrap and get things done. And sometimes even then, they're not gonna settle into the wrap right away. So what I like to do is go for a walk, whether it's just walking around my house. Like if I put the baby in the wrap and the baby's a little fussy, but I know that all baby's needs have been met, I'll either walk around my house or go for a walk outside and it doesn't take long, maybe five minutes to get them to settle in. Or one thing that works really well is bouncing on the birth ball or yoga ball or whatever you have. So I keep my birth ball out for like the first couple of months because anytime baby is gassy and fussy and I just don't want to walk around, I sit with the baby over my shoulder on the ball and bounce and it, it works like a charm every time. My kids know this, so sometimes they'll take the baby and sit and bounce with them and try to get him to sleep. It's super sweet, so that's just a little trick for you there. All right, so I did say that we would do some baking and make something delicious today, and that's what I'm doing. I am making sourdough monkey bread. Monkey bread is one of my husband's favorite things and he doesn't even know this is sourdough. Like I just don't tell him and he can't tell the difference. Not that he would care. It, he just doesn't care. Like he doesn't care. He just wants me to make delicious food. He doesn't care if it's sourdough or not. But um, this is a great way to use sourdough starter. It uses a whole cup of starter. I will link the recipe in the full recipe with step-by-step -step instructions in the description for you. But this is essentially just a variation of my sourdough discard biscuit dough that if you've been following, you've seen me use that biscuit dough for so many things. And this is just another way to use that. So the recipe is four cups of flour, four teaspoons of baking powder, a half cup of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of cinnamon, one cup of butter melted, one cup of sourdough starter, and it can be active starter or discard, one cup of milk, one teaspoon of vanilla, and two eggs. That makes the dough. Um, and then you'll need a bunt pan, of course. I have a cast iron bunt pan, which I really like. I just love cast iron. It's so durable. Um, then, you know, you roll out your, your biscuit dough in like an 18 by 18 square or so. It doesn't have to be perfect. You want it to be about a quarter inch thick and cut it into one by one squares and those will be coated in the cinnamon sugar mixture which is just a cup of butter or I'm sorry a cup of sugar and a tablespoon of cinnamon. I'm also mixing together a cup of butter and a half cup of brown sugar on the stove going to bring that just to a boil and then remove that from heat and that will be poured over the monkey bread before it bakes in the oven. So this whole process is pretty easy. I mean, it doesn't take that long to make the dough. You don't have to let it rise. No fermenting time. This is a sourdough discard recipe, so pretty quick. Now, you really want to make sure that you're, if you're using a cast iron, bunt pan or just whatever bunt pan you're using, make sure that you grease it very well. You do not want your monkey bread to stick. 
I mean, it will taste the same, but there's really just no way to salvage a cake or anything that has stuck to a bunt pan. You're going to totally lose the shape. So since I'm using this cast iron one, I just went ahead and heated it on the stove top a little bit. And I mean, it's well seasoned. I have all my cast iron well seasoned, but still I heated it a little bit on the stove and then melted some butter and spread that around the entire inner surface just to make sure that this is not going to stick. Now I'm tossing all of my, you know, little homemade biscuit dough pieces in the cinnamon sugar, placing those in the bundt pan and going to pour the butter and brown sugar mix over top. And this will get baked at 350 degrees for 40 to 45 minutes or so. Just watch the top so that it looks golden brown. And if you want, you can stick a toothpick or a fork down as far as you can into the uh, monkey bread and just make sure that it's not doughy in the center. Um, one thing I would also do is maybe like place a cookie sheet on the lower rack of the oven just in case it bubbles up over the top. You don't want to smoke yourself out of your house um, and that, that caramelized mixture, mixture, if it overflows out of the bun pan, it, it really will like create a lot of smoke. Ask me how I know. Anyway. Um, just taking some time to do some laundry, fold some diapers, little man is sleeping in his little cradle here. I think I've talked to you guys about back to sleep, belly to sleep. Um, I think I talked about it in one of my pregnancy videos, maybe it was my labor video, or my birth video, or my prep video, I don't remember. But essentially, belly sleeping does not cause SIDS, vaccines causes that, um, they just made that up so that they could shift the blame away from that very profitable um, industry. Anyway, I forgot to set the timer and burnt this thing to a crisp. So we're going to make another one. And you know, it would be so easy for me to edit that out and just be like, oh, well, I don't want to show them the fact that I forgot to do something and ruined what I was making. But I don't know. I mean, you guys know how it is. <laughs> You're not. Maybe you'll judge me. I don't care because that's just how it is, especially with the newborn. Um, I don't know, like it's just <laughs> things get a little bit crazy and your mind is not all there. Your hormones are really shifting and you can be really, really forgetful, like, you know, putting your remote in the fridge, that kind of stuff. It, it just happens. And that happened to me. So I, I did smoke the house out. Um from my burnt monkey bread, but that's okay because I, it was really just the top that burnt. So I scraped the top off and was able to salvage that, but I wanted to make a really pretty one and photograph it for the blog and show you guys what it looks like when it's actually not burnt to a crisp. So we'll do that. And at the end of this video, you'll see the not burnt monkey bread. But, um, in the meantime, just moving right along to another day doing another task here. I actually think this was maybe the Saturday, it was like around Easter time because we were getting ready to go to an Easter function and I just made some deviled eggs. Something easy that doesn't take a lot of time or effort and still allows me to contribute. You know, I have five children and that is more than anyone on either side of the family. We are the biggest family by far. And so I, I just can't show up without any kind of food because my family eats a lot of food. And we're just not living in an era where large families, that that's not the norm currently. But it used to be, you know, I when I was little, I loved going to um, holiday gatherings for my dad's side of the family. His, his grandmother and grandfather had 10 or 11 children, I forget, but it was it was a big family, but that was actually the norm back then. You have to look back, you know, four, five generations to see that as the norm, but it was the norm. I think um, at the turn of the 20th century, the average, the birth rate was maybe eight. I've seen different figures between six and eight. So, you know, every, every family had six to eight children on average. And, you know, that's an average. So, yes, you had really big families who would have double that or more. And then you had couples who couldn't have children at all. So it all balanced out, but the average was six to eight children. So no matter where you went, when you went to church, when you went to a holiday gathering, when you got together with anyone, 
everybody had a lot of children. And so I would imagine, and I, I've actually studied this a lot, you know, that historically, um, how women navigated the pregnancy postpartum period. And it, it was no big deal for a woman who had five, six, seven, eight children to completely, you know, kind of take off in her postpartum period and rest because everybody had big families and, you know, it, it wasn't a big deal to pitch in. People were used to cooking for large groups and that's just kind of the way it was. But it's not that way now and it's going to take some time to recover that if we recover that. I mean, I think we will. Um, people are waking up about birth control, how toxic that is. We've been sold a lie, a very convenient lie, a very comfortable lie, um, uh, you know, that birth control is for women's health and it's never for women's health. I remember being told that in high school, like just get on birth control and it will take away your cramps, your acne, it'll make everything better. That was the solution to everything. I mean, how many of you can relate? You go to the doctor and birth control, that's your solution. But it's not. It just masks problems temporarily. Anyway, so that's an, another tangent while I was making my deviled eggs there. I have that recipe linked in the description for you guys. Um, that's something I'd, I've made for you before. But spicy deviled eggs with bacon, that's, that's like the best thing ever. So here I was trying to get some things done and my husband helped, was very kind to help me. And he was telling me stories from when I was in labor because it was all such a blur to me. It was such a long labor that I actually had to ask a lot of questions like, what happened here? What happened at this time? So he, he was just telling me stories there from when my mom and sister were laughing at him when I was in labor because he, he had stepped on a toy and it really hurt and it, it was just kind of funny. But anyway, don't show the trad wives that clip because if they see my husband helping me change the sheets, you know, I might be banned from whatever. I don't know. I don't care. Don't care. Don't want to know about these labels that are ridiculous. Like in an effort to counter the scorekeeping 50-50 parenting, they've gone the complete opposite direction to make it where you can't help your spouse with anything. Anyway, enough of that. Maybe we'll maybe we'll talk about that another day. Do like a whole video and a whole talk on division of labor and roles within marriage and how people can go completely insane with that. But here's my monkey bread. In the meantime, my not burnt to a crisp monkey bread that I was able to photograph for the blog that way I can get my recipe up and it is so good. So good. I promise you guys it's it's very delicious, not dry very moist, very buttery, very sugary, so definitely not not low calorie. I will link the full recipe in the description for you and that is all for this week. I will see you next week.